uh, this, this morning, I'll give some reflections. These are reflections, they're not doctrines, so just to encourage you to listen uh, in an open way. At this moment, at this time and in this place, this, we can uh, at least be awake and aware, present. And the, the word Dhamma is uh, translated as the truth of the way it is which is not descriptive, it is not, not defining Dhamma, but it's pointing to what, what way is it right now at this moment <clears throat> for each one of you. And, and nobody can define it, I'm sure. It's not a matter of trying to figure out what way it is, but trusting in the simple act of awareness, of this open attention, attentiveness, a relaxed state of openness. So it's not, you don't create it, you can't kind of make it that way. You, it's an attitude of being present, of open receptivity, <clears throat> both to you know, the experience that you're individually having, physically, emotionally, or the atmosphere, the conditions that are affecting you, the the place you're in, the that which you is uh, coming through, affecting consciousness through your senses, is like this. And when we use words like like this or the way it is. Some people find this frustrating because uh, we want we want to be told how it is or how we should see it or what Dhamma really is. Because our conditioning is like that. We want answers to questions, solutions to problems, everything named, defined, categorized. And this is where we we fail in our practice. Because all this desire to define, to to uh, want something to be, to have answers, and all this is this desire arises out of ignorance, not understanding, not having paid attention, reflected or observed how it is, but merely operating from conditioning of the mind. The light in that keeps flashing on and off in the back. Now one way of reflecting in this moment is that, that we're experiencing consciousness through form. So just using these kind of words, using the word consciousness and the, the form of, of your own body from where you are at this point in time sitting here. Consciousness. 
So taking these words, uh, and then these are teachings, Dharma teachings, but therefore attention for well, the form and consciousness is like this. So we're experiencing the, the breathing, uh, the, the posture that we're in, the sitting posture, the, the conditions uh, that we're having through the, through the body, and that's because we can feel, we can experience because of consciousness. So this is the way it is. It's not, it's not, we're not saying defining it or putting value judgments on it, saying it's good or bad, or how it should or shouldn't be. Just learning to trust this inner sense, this intuitive sense of this is the way it is, like this. Sitting, experiencing the sitting postures like this. Now being aware of, of the posture of your own body, you know, it's using these four postures, sitting, standing, walking, lying down, <clears throat> pointing to what's quite obvious and ordinary, nothing special. These not seeking special postures to be aware, like standing on our heads or standing on one foot, but on just the ordinary movement of our human bodies throughout the day and night. We're either sitting, standing, walking, or lying down. We're breathing, inhaling, exhaling. So bringing attention just to these simple realities of this moment is establishing mindfulness. This being with the reality of sitting is like this. Not saying how you should be sitting even, or, or what you should be experienced while sitting, or what you should do while you're sitting. I'm not giving any advice whatsoever other than an encouragement towards using the posture that you're in for awareness. It's like this, sitting, the, ex the reality of sitting, for me at this moment, the experience of sitting is like this. So this brings me, uh, brings my attention to the physical body that's present. Its weight, I feel its weight on the mat, hands touching each other, where the feet, the knees, the legs, the spinal column, so forth, just observing, being a witness, a knower of the body sitting is like this. Now when I speak like this, what does that do? Does that you know, when you try to figure it out, think about it, that's not the point. It's not a matter of trying to get detailed explanations, but encouragement towards encouraging you to, to trust your own awareness. I can't experience your body from where you are. I certainly do experience the, the reality of this form, this body that I call my body, the way it is right now, is like this. So this is paying attention, isn't it? This is a, it's a different use of your mind. It's non-intellectual.
And then the breath, the anapanasati, the breathing is like this. So then people say, should I focus on the nostril, on the belly? <laughs> because we have different techniques. Wherever, wherever you want to, wherever you feel the breath, just notice the breathing of the body. It, with this attitude of it is the way it is, it's like this, inhaling's like this, exhaling. Now I'm trying to force a kind of samadhi practices on this and kind of concentrate on it. Means that we we're caught, we have to do something with it. But th I'm just what I'm pointing to is an attitude of non-striving, attentiveness, attention, a relaxed attention and awareness. It's an, an invitation or an encouragement rather than an imperative. It's not filled with shoulds and shouldn'ts and all kinds of advice. It's a gentle encouragement to trust awareness. Awareness is like this. So I use this, the, the, the posture, the breath, and then a sound of silence, what I call sound of silence. As you, be, as you relax into the present, I just notice any, any, if you've got to do something or get something, just be aware of it. It's not trying to stop or not feel these things, but not to be caught up in your habitual reactions, the momentum of habits that seem to propel one and control one all the time. So meditation is an unpacha called holiday for the heart. It's a rest, it's a it's relaxed. So when you form ideas about attaining and getting states in samadhi and that, what does that do when you feel you've got to get something you don't have? Just start noticing. Uh, uh, you know, you read the scriptures or read various books and hear teachers talking and it's all this getting the, getting the jhanas and then doing the vipassana or the various advice uh, or how you you read scriptures, Pali scriptures, tends to create a sense of having to do something. But we're not saying you don't have to do anything, but pointing to this awareness where this, these things of must and mustn't, should and shouldn't, have to get, have to get rid of are seen, recognized, rather than the very vehicle we use for practice, our desires, our views and opinions as our vehicle. We'll always feel disappointed if, if that's what we're doing.
So then awareness, I like to use the, the word listening. It's a, because like the ability to listen in the present, is, it's kind of all-encompassing, not listening for anything in particular, not listening to something in particular, but allowing the listening ability, the hearing, just to be open and receptive in this attitude of relax attention. Now, using this this word listening, me it has this, this sense of like a I was I used to imagine like a red Indian brave out in the forest, just completely alert and attentive to any sound, sound of the wind, rustle of leaves, anything in this broad spectrum of attentiveness rather than concentrated on any sound or any, looking for anything. This thing of poised, the kind of poised attentiveness in the present. But not forced, in it, not, you're not looking, you're not trying to concentrate on anything, but an attitude of relaxation, openness, receptivity. Then I hear this resonating, is it a sound or vibration, whatever it is, people want to define it all the time. In, uh, when I was in Spirit Rock, <laughs> what is it, you know, is it the nervous system or is it the cosmic sound of the universe or is it tinnitus or, you know, what we this desire to define it, observe this, wanting to, to, uh, to, to have put something onto it, get proof for it. Is it in the scriptures? Is it really Buddhism? Is it, did the Buddha teach this? And these are, the thinking mind starts, you know, doing that, you know, wanting wanting uh, verification that this is really something uh, you could be doing. Or is it worth anything? Is it just Ajahn Sumedho's crazy idea? So I, it's just a recommendation if, for those that find, you know, I found it a very useful way of very immediate way of awareness, learning to recognize this background like a stream, a flowing, resonating stream. It's not like sound in the sense of one that arises and ceases, begins and ends. It has this stream-like continuity a flowingness. And it's natural, it's not created. And it's not just me because, uh, you know, people, every, everybody can hear it, not just some kind of quirky thing in my, in my head. <clears throat> Thank you.
Now, if you, you know, just important to reflect on the way it is, you're, you're not creating it, you're not trying to construct anything or project anything into this present moment. And so it's not a matter of you creating something and then trying to sustain your own images or creations or ideas or opinions. That's why it's a relaxed state. It's not kind of forcing, you know, absorbing into something and 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 for and are trying to keep uh, re recreating it. But this attitude of of poised attentiveness, relaxed attentiveness. Getting a feeling for this because it's quite a lovely way to be. Now in the focusing on the the posture, physical posture and the breath. These you don't create either. They are the way they are. You're not, you're not creating any kind of images around your body. You're just paying attention to it. The reality of sitting and breathing. Then sound of silence is like in the background. It's a, rather than at first, because I use the word sound, we tend to see it or experience it as hearing, hearing some kind of sound through the ears. So people do get stuck in their heads this way. <clears throat> because the, the nature of perception, sound, the English word sound, is always connected to, to the ear faculty. But as you relax more, you, it's more like a, a background. It's behind you. And it, it has no boundary where breathing begins and ends, doesn't it? Inhalation begins and ends. Exhalation begins and ends. Constant change. And then the uh, posture body moves from sitting to standing to walking to lying down. But this nada sound, Pali word nada, which means sound also, one can be aware of this while breathing and sitting, standing, walking, lying down through the various movements of your physical body throughout the day and night. It's not dependent on, on you know, on even a ideal situation, on peace and quiet and meditation retreats and so forth. Like, like when we want tranquility as our main goal, then we have to control a situation, go off to a place, uh, shut down the sensory input. But as we develop awareness and insight through this, then we, it doesn't, you know, whatever, where, where we, ever we are, it's the place of awareness, of seeing Dhamma, of knowing Dhamma the way it is.
I just notice any tendency to, you know, how we hold the word meditation, the English word meditation, can arouse this, uh, I've got to do it, I've got to practice. How words do affect consciousness. The, the, we can see meditation as a, something we've got to get, we've got to do. So, you know, with all good intentions and commitment to practice, we can spend our lives always, you know, with this, with a compulsive attitude about meditation without recognizing. We meditate from, from, this, from this position of compulsive, uh, from a compulsion to do it rather than a real sense of trusting yourself in, in the present to be open. Be at ease in this moment, not trying to get anything or get rid of anything. So notice that these, this, these are ordinary things. These aren't special. The breathing of your body. We're not say, trying to refine the breathing and, and uh, have special breathing practices or postures, nothing special, it's quite ordinary. The posture, the body in the present, the breathing, sound of silence. These are ordinary, entirely tamada. There is the word dhamma. Dhamma is ordinary. Tamada, it's ordinary. It's not high and something, you know, far away and, and abstruse and all that. It, that we might create, you know, views about dhamma and and philosophize about Dhamma, make it sound very complicated. Or is it just this, this ordinariness, just this simpleness, this simple, the simplicity of being aware, conscious and aware, awakened and conscious. Because consciousness we don't create, isn't it? Consciousness is not something I create. It's the way it is. Whether I'm happy, sad, sane, insane, whatever, you know, this consciousness is still operating. And uh, mindfulness, paying attention, is awaken, consciousness awake. Because we can be conscious and ignorant and not awake. So we live in, in our own worlds, you know, the worlds we create out of ignorance. So the world, you know, what society is doing, why there's so much endless problems and misunderstanding <clears throat> because uh, everybody's living in their own world their own creation, their own uh, 
the worlds that they create. And we do it too, and we, we can be living here at Chitters and live in our own world all the time. What I mean by this, like in the <clears throat> The five khandhas, for example, rupa, vedana, sanya, sankara, vijnana. As reflect when you're when you're born as baby, newborn baby is has a form, physical body, and it's conscious. Doesn't have a name yet. No identities. It is a, you know. It isn't identified with a body or being English or French or anything like that, male or female. But consciousness, form and consciousness. And then after birth and after we get, after we're physically born, then the conditioning process starts operating. Your mother, Father, relatives, society, influence. We create ourselves from that. After birth, we're not born with it. So like cultural conditioning, isn't it? Social conditioning, uh, ethnic conditioning, religious conditioning, you know, identity with class and race, gender, nationality. These are conditioned into the mind after birth and these conditions are from ignorance, from avicca. So the sense of yourself and your self-worth is all conditioned, you know, after birth. It's not natural. Like consciousness is, is natural, isn't it? This way. The body is a natural form. This is nature. This is Dhamma. But then as we develop attachments to the conditioning that we have in through consciousness, we create a world that separates us from everything else, our own world, a sense of ourself, in other words, the ego or sakya ditti. Sila Pata Baramasa, Wichikicha, and these are the Pali words, the first three fetters, <coughs> what are they called, Sanyojanas, the first three Sanyojanas that, that uh, blind us to Dhamma, to the reality to reality, to truth, is, uh, is the conditioning that we acquire after birth. So in awakened awareness, attention, consciousness is like this. Awakened consciousness is just this, nothing special. It's just paying attention, not trying to get anything or get rid of anything or prove anything or answer any question or solve any problem. But just trusting yourself in this very moment here and now to be awake, attentive, 
poised, relaxed, resting in this moment. A recognizing this, just this, even a flash of recognition. That's where, where it's like, it is just like this. When I, when I think this, just this way, like this. I find that it helps to, using the thought process in this way was pointing at the way it is, not defining it, not describing it, not judging it, it's not judging, it's not critical, just using language to notice. Now, with the using the nada as a way of practice, I found because it does stop the thinking process. When I started meditating years ago, I had I was I had I was an obsessed thinker. I've been overly educated and had developed all kinds of uh, obsessions and thinking and thinking were just non-stop thinking patterns. So I could figure things out, you know, I could reason and, and things like that. I could learn how to use thought 
But I had become a victim of my own thinking habits. I didn't know how to get out of it. You know, I realized it would be nice if I could just stop thinking, get some peace, because the, the obsessive thinking as a, as a habit, as many of you know, is very, you know, it's ongoing. It ends in worry and anxiety and self-aversion and paranoia and self-consciousness and endless kind of uh, complication. You're never really present. You're always thinking about where you're going next or what you look like or what you should be doing right now or what shouldn't be or, you know, comparing this moment or this place with some other place. I remember you going, you know, sightseeing tours and going looking at mountains and then always feeling compelled to think about them and compare them to some other mountain or some other scene with some other place and the mind endlessly kind of proliferating on and on and on until you just want to either get drunk or go to sleep <laughs> obliterate yourself So we become a victim of our own thoughts, you know, our thinking process. We, 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 it's so, you know, highly conditioned in, through modern education. We're, we're educated to, to think about life, not to open and recognize and realize truth, but to think about life. Now, recognizing the thinking process not to be despised, but it is a very limited function of the mind and it's a critical function thinking is about comparing isn't it it knows what's good better best bad worse worst tall and short fat and thin male and female all this the thinking process knows which is what is better than what we, can, we know how things should be when we think. We can create ideals about perfect societies, perfect men, perfect women, perfect monasteries. You know, where everything is as it should be. This is thought process and this is thinking. We can take it to the superlative level and then to the, other, to the opposite shouldn't be, shouldn't be like this. It's bad, too, it's horrible, evil, heaven, hell. <clears throat> so this dualism is a creation of thought, isn't it? Because thinking has this limitation. It's a created, you know, it's a language is a we aren't born speaking any language, are we? We learn languages after we're born. And our languages that we learn are very much culturally tainted, aren't they? They're not from Dhamma, from, from a real profound understanding of the way it is. They're from various cultural prejudices, biases, assumptions, Necessity, so you know, they say that Eskimos have 22 different words for snow. <clears throat> for us, we just have snow <laughs> because that's all we need. It doesn't snow that much here. If you're living in the Arctic, then snow is, you know, your life. You're living with different kinds of snow all the time. So you discriminate, you know, what, what it is like. This is the ability to discriminate.
So when we're just trying to think and figure out and we're caught on that level, we, we're caught in this dualism. In, in it. And that's where learning to stop thinking, to get to remember this natural state of being that isn't dependent on thought. But which we've forgotten. We, we it becomes it's never pointed to, never recognized in our society. It's uh, because our Western society is very much a society about thinking and becoming, attaining and achieving. And so, intuitive awareness is not something that's that I've ever been taught anyway, and through the. Uh, Western educational system, or my parents, or anyone else. So what we're doing, when the Buddha was pointing to awareness or mindfulness, the sati sampachanya, sati mindfulness, sampachanya, apperception or intuition, It's not a thinking process. It's aperceive is is an intuitive sense of conscious, but not thinking. Not it's receiving. At this moment, the way it is, whatever way it is, you know, it's, it's not we're not defining or judging, but opening, recognizing, realizing. So these words, English words like recognizing, realizing, are best uh, to, w w the best words to that I've found to describe or to point to this natural state of attentiveness. It's like this: the rea reality is now. And then the thinking process stops because, you know, the desire to, well, what is reality right now? What are you talking about? And then the desire to figure it out and have me kind of maybe go on a long discourse on reality. But it, why, you know, how can one describe every description will, will take you further away from it. So it's a matter of Learning to trust yourself, not not any view or opinion, but this awareness, getting to to recognize and this natural state of being. It's just this, you know, the reality. Realization now. The thinking mind stops, and there's this sense of doubt or uncertainty might arise because we want something, we want to find something. We aren't used to trusting ourselves or being aware. It makes us very uncomfortable. So with this awareness, just learning to trust it and relax, let go of everything, not trying to figure out or even grasp the words I'm saying, 
don't do that either. But recognizing. It's uh, uh, receiving this moment and whatever state of emotional state you're in, whatever physical state, whatever, wherever you are, whatever is happening, isn't the issue anymore. It's like this. So more and more you begin to, to realize the deathless reality here and now is like this. You start discerning, you're able to discern the difference. The Amata Dhamma is this, like this. The death, the world that we create is, is a death experience. You know, we create death. Our creations out of ignorance are all about birth and death, attachment, ignorance, suffering. <clears throat> so that's why as a person, you know, just trying to find, seek personal happiness is so futile. And that we, we get mom momentary personal happiness, but it's non-sustainable. So this natural state is non-personal, it's not personal, there's no personality. It's, it has no quality. It's not good, bad, right, wrong, red or blue. But it, through recognizing this natural state, then the conditioned realm is in perspective. You know, we can begin to notice the arising, ceasing, thoughts arising, emotions arising, ceasing, the body, its state, its, its being of pleasure, pain, heat and cold, the sensory world that we're experiencing the, <clears throat> through the eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body. Through the mind, the, the sensitivity, the Vedana, Sanya, Sankara is seen in terms of Dhamma. So this discerning Dhamma, all conditions are impermanent, Sape Sankara Nicha. All Sankaras are Nicha. All conditions are impermanent. So conditioned phenomena is this, you, that which is observed, you know, the rising, the breathing, the body, the thoughts, the emotions, the sensory experiences of pleasure, pain, neutral sensation. So this sati sampachanya then allow us to discern. It's a discerning ability, not a critical one. Uh, emphasizing the difference between the critical factors, which is thought, 
based on the evaluating conditioned phenomena. Heaven and hell is conditioned phenomena. Good and bad, right and wrong. Discerning, then, in terms of sati sampachanya, sati panya, or w wisdom, panya translated as discernment or wisdom, discern knowing that the unconditioned, discerning, knowing that suffering and non suffering, discerning, being able to know the difference. It's not judging. Self and non-self, atta and anatta. Discerning. Non-self is like this. Anatta is like this. Atta is when I start thinking. I create myself. I'm Ajahn Sumedho. <laughs> I don't know, the whole scenario the whole history, memories, that American monk, that kind of thing, that's all, that's a conventional atta or self. Discerning that, that's, that's not reality. That American monk, Ajahn Sumedho, that's not reality. That's a convention only. It's not, it has no soul, no essence or substance, it's just kind of, it is what it is, but it's, it's certainly ephemeral and unsatisfying. But anatta, is relief, saying it's like being free from these limitations, of me and mine and identity with the body, with my appearance, with my position, with my nationality, with my past, with my fears, with my desires, with my habits, with my obsessions, which, you know, they go on and on and on. They just get, you know, when you're 71 years old, you have a lot of memories. But non-self, anatta, is like this, is peace. Not being anybody or anything isn't, uh, you know, is, is, is a bliss. When I become somebody, then I'm, I, I'm limited again. And if I'm not aware, I just operate from habit, from the ego, then all, you know, life, even, uh, you know, at its best, is, has endless problems and difficulties and fears and resentments. So discerning, you know, the, say, dukkha and non-dukkha, suffering and non-suffering. Attachment and non-attachment. So your your intuitive sense is operating. You see, attachment to conditions out of ignorance is is uh, like you know grasping fire. It hurts every time. When you be, when you really trust your discerning abilities, you see how that sangsara that that the momentum of just operating from conditioning, from habit, from creating your own world, yourself, and all that. Even at its best, there's still something un totally unsatisfying about it. Something missing, something lacking, incomplete. 
and then anxiety and fear haunt our lives. But when we let go of the conditioned world, we're not destroying it. It's not a judgment of like, get rid of it or deny it or reject it, but let go of it, no longer let it delude you. No longer allow the conditioned realm that we're experiencing delude us, be victims of it, but the knower of it, knower of Dhamma, the way it is. So this is like an attitude that uh, trying to encourage an attitude rather than a method. Now methods, you know, are all right, but they, you know, if you if you have the wrong attitude, start with the wrong attitude, then you know the method can't. You know, if you just cling to a method, it. You know, it can take you so far, maybe, to a bit of tranquility, but that, and then it, it can't do much more than that. It's not liberating, till the right attitude. A basic wrong attitude is, is the me and mine. Just notice how, you know, the sense of me having me practicing meditation, me being ignorant and confused person that needs to practice in order to become enlightened. Just starting from the, the, the sense of myself as somebody that has to do something in order to become something. Now with this, I really investigate this because I deliberately think, you know, I would deliberately bring this into consciousness. I am this person. I've got all these kind of problems and I need to practice in order to get rid of the, well, the asavas and the uh, defilements and the devaranas and the fetters and uh, in order to become uh, enlightened in the future. This is a creation, isn't it? This sense of I'm somebody like this who needs to, I'm not good enough the way I am, I need to do something now in order to become something better in the future. This is, this is a delusion. And yet how many of you operate from that delusion in your monastic life? You know, quite, because it seems very real in the, in the world that we live in. Personally, personality-wise, it 
it's the way it is, you know. My personality is never going to be enlightened. Personalities are not, you know, not the means of enlightenment. So personally, I can be confused with greed, hatred, delusion, fears, jealousies, emotional problems, bad habits, obsessions, personally. But that which is aware is non-personal. So awareness, the sati, is the path to the deathless. Mindfulness, heedfulness, being attentive, is the deathless itself. So that's why uh, recognizing this is a natural state, not a created state. It's not refined. It's not like, you know, refined conscious experience. Or, you know, it's not precious. It's not depending on ideal conditions for supporting it. Where refined conscious experiences are very dependent on ideal conditions. <coughs> If you get too refined, then, then, uh, then you become what we call a precious person. You, you're too, you, you can't take the coarseness of life. It just shatters you. Any harsh word or tsunami just totally destroys everything for you. You're just overwhelmed and overcome by even the slightest Somebody looks at you cross-eyed, destroys your whole day because you've become so dependent on refinement, on things being pleasant, peaceful, calm, refined. But awareness isn't that way. It's not precious. It's just learning to recognize it and trust it. It's strong, it's stable, real in the, in the uh, vortex of change, incessant, relentless change that we're experiencing through the senses. The stable point, the stability we find is through awareness, not through control. So during this retreat, it uh, encouraging you to trust yourself more, recognize, you know, it's not a matter of attaining anything or getting anything out of this retreat. If you're using this retreat in order to get something, notice this, how even the word retreat can you can, you know, how easily that's a state of becoming, using it to get something, or get your practice together, or get your samadhi. That's not, none of these are wrong, you know, in terms of, because then it's wrong and right and good and bad, but, but these are conditions that we create. Just the way we, we, we hold the perception of this is a retreat, this is the vasa. Words like chitters, forest monastery, or things like this. These are these affect consciousness. We have our own preferences, biases, emotional reactions to them. 
So the awareness discerns this, you know, the retreat. The, some people, you know, I remember in the old days, winter retreats. Some people get, start dreading it. They, we're, we have to prepare for the winter retreat. And they, oh, God, winter retreat, three months ago, oh, no, cold. And, and uh, I don't know if I can stand it, you know. And everybody starts, you know, nobody's talking, everybody's silent. And, Say winter retreat, and you go into you contract. So a few years ago at Amravati, I had the conviviality retreat. Three months of conviviality. Just to change, just to reflect that the way that everybody just regarded re winter retreat at Amravati. You know, they get into, don't talk to me, I'm practicing. I've got to practice. I don't have time to be friendly or smile or be nice or anything else. This is real serious practice. And don't, don't speak to me. Don't bother me. And we get into, into the controlling mode of, of uh, you know, this is, this is my time, my space for my retreat. And don't you mess it up is not a conducive state towards liberation. And that it's, it's, you're set, set up for misery. <clears throat> Where conviviality conveys a kind of, not, you don't have to go around being nice and friendly and chat with everybody, but it's an attitude of relaxed and openness and happy state of mind friendly, receptive, joyfulness of, of being, rather than of, I've got to get my samadhi kind of mind state, which to me destroys life for me. Having to control everything and then resent anyone that gets in my way. This is, this is not peaceful or beautiful way to be. So, knowing, knowing how words affect consciousness, and you know, this, this, uh, just to observe how, how you, you hold the, the most ordinary words we use, like meditation or retreat. Not to criticize, the, you know, or say that you're holding it wrong, but just trusting yourself to observe how, how it does affect. Once you're really aware of how these words affect your consciousness. You can, then that's, then you can see yourself, the suffering, or the way of non-suffering. We can still use the words, but we don't, we're not, we're not caught in the, in the uh, reactivity, the blind reactivity that we were before. So then various meditation techniques, methods, and so forth, are mindfulness practices rather than than uh, things we're holding with our egos, trying to make them work for me, and so I can get something or get rid of something. So, time to cease this.